Welcome to Civil Med. Joining me today is Sabrina Palmen, who is the CEO and co-founder of the software solutions firm, Palki. Um, Sabrina is here in Armenia for this year's Femino Conference, which is um, which celebrates female innovation in Armenia, in the region, and beyond. So, Sabrina, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, you are recognized as one of the 100 brilliant uh, women in AI ethics in 2024, and you also serve as an expert men member for artificial intelligence at the European Committee for Standardization. Right? Uh, could you give us an overview of your concerns for AI ethics and how maybe your uh, background in marketing also has influenced your approach to data governance and AI ethics? Yes, of course, more than happy to. I think I perhaps start with the latter part of the question first. So I did, I usually say like I started my career on the dark side <laughs> in marketing about like 13, 14 years ago. And at the time, I don't necessarily AI wasn't very much a topic mm -hmm. at all. It was something from the future. And um, I would say it was more at the time that I've gained interest in the power of data and what we can achieve with data. Mm -hmm. And of course, to make our lives more comfortable, because at the end of the day, that's the idea that we use data to make our day to day lives easier, mm -hmm. but also how it could be used in a negative way and potentially even to manipulate us in one way or the other. And I think marketing often is sort of on that, that fine balance sometimes, although I'm a huge, huge um, fan of, of a good marketing campaign. And um, it's not like that I said like, oh, I want to venture into data governance. This is such an exciting world. I sort of slipped into this. So after my MBA in, in China, in Shanghai, I decided to enter into the tech and innovation industry. And then as part of that, um, that was around the time when the European Data Protection Regulation was taking effect, mm -hmm. the GDPR, mm -hmm. and it sort of fell onto my lap. And so I then started to work myself into the industry um, and, and got very interested in, again, the power of data and how we can make sure that we're using data responsibly while innovating. And so I specialized in data protection, expanded into information security and standardization, and uh, then decided in 2019 to found my own company, Palki, mm -hmm. which specializes in smart data governance solutions. And then as part of that, with the evolution of data governance and handling data responsibly, um, we then also expanded into AI trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of ethics, so when we talk about AI trustworthiness, it really contains or, or really what it means. We're talking about three pillars mm -hmm. and these three pillars means that AI needs to be lawful. So it needs to comply with laws and regulations and copyright laws and respect your fundamental rights and freedoms. It needs to be robust. In this case, AI needs to be able to perform consistently over time, and it needs to be able to deal with new AI-specific cyber threats, mm -hmm. and it needs to be ethical. Now, when we talk about ethics, I think in different countries, ethics can mean something different. But I think in the European Union's context, um, it's very much focused on protecting the fundamental rights and freedoms of individuals. The AI shouldn't discriminate against certain groups and people. And so this is then something that we are looking very much into and specifically highly regulated markets that can have a huge positive, but potentially also negative impact on individuals if the AI, for instance, is mm -hmm. biased. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that actually brings me to your talk that you had at Femino, uh, which was about monitoring unwanted bias and consistency in AI. Uh, could you provide con a concrete example maybe of what that bias, how it manifests itself in AI and what steps are being taken to really address those issues? Of course. So I think you always think like, OK, this is the stuff of the future, but we're actually experiencing this today already. And I think one of the challenges with AI is, is that AI today is trained on the data that reflects our society today and our beliefs and our own bias. It's in our nature as humans to be biased. And so the data that is used to train the AI by default is biased as well. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say it's possible actually to to create an AI system that isn't biased, but it's important to understand potential limitations and develop an AI system in a way that it's safe to, to use. Mm -hmm. And I think some examples, for instance, um, there were actually some use cases in the US where um, they've developed an AI system 
that uses facial recognition technology and in some occasions it wrongfully identified someone as a criminal based on their skin color. And there was even a case where that individual was arrested um, for I think more than 48 hours or so. So imagine that just simply based on your skin color, you're automatically disadvantaged. Mm. I think another case that is already quite well known is in the HR uh, space. And HR is actually one of the sectors that is already quite heavily implementing AI systems mm. to speed up the recruitment process. And here it turned out that there's, there are a variety of AI systems that have biases as well. So for instance, if they automatically select um, or rank CVs based on best fit for a job opportunity, um, imagine that AI system is, shows tendencies of bias towards migrants or again based on you know how you're writing your CV. It's clear that maybe you're, I'm, I'm from originally from Germany, I speak international English, mm -hmm. so even though I'm fluent, I maybe structure my sentences slightly differently mm -hmm. than someone who is native, uh, a native English speaker. So that even could influence the output of an AI system and automatically rank my CV lower, even if I have the same level of experience or even better experience than yeah, someone sure. someone else. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so I think it's very important, that especially in these sort of industries, I mean, healthcare included finance, that we develop AI systems that are fair mm -hmm. and that make sure we are not um, putting certain people and individuals at a disadvantage. Um, and then, a little bit earlier, you mentioned the GDPR as a regulatory um, system, basically. And that was introduced in 2018 in the EU. And then more recently, there was the AI Act that is being introduced. Um, what are some challenges that firms in Europe face uh, when trying to comply with these regulations? And then on the other side of that, should companies outside of those regulations, for example, in Armenia, also aim to align with those standards as well? Mm, so, I mean, the GDPR had a, quite a big impact, right? So it started in Europe and internationally, I think we've seen a lot of countries implementing data protection laws, many of them heavily inspired by the GDPR. And then there's also something called the Brussels effect where Europe is leading very much the way when it comes to regulating. And that then has an international impact because even um, if, if a country doesn't have, for instance, a data protection law, the moment a business wants to expand into Europe and operate in Europe, they will have to comply with the regulation. Mm -hmm. And with the EU AI Act, I think there is a similar anticipation that it will have a global impact. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant about that because uh, the EU AI Act fundamentally is different to the GDPR as it's in it covers a specific technology. The GDPR covers data protection across your tech stack, across the organization, and how data comes and flows through the company and you know leaves the company. Whereas AI is tech specific, and it's essentially a law covering product liability. Again, of course, the moment you want to offer AI services in the European Union, you the EU AI Act automatically um, will apply, and businesses will have to assess, okay, where where do we sit in terms of the scope? Mm. And here specifically, I think um, also from from a perspective for Armenia, I think generally the intention of course is with AI systems that you're not limiting yourself locally, that you can expand internationally and offer your services internationally. And Armenia has a great growing tech community and, and brilliant minds with uh, you know great solutions that can potentially change the world. <laughs> you never know. And I think you know that's the exciting piece with AI that you're not limited to, to where you're based. Yeah. But yes, the moment you want to expand into Europe, you will need to comply with the law. And if you're falling into the definition of a high-risk AI system, the requirements are broad. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of businesses will struggle um, because especially startups and SMEs who don't necessarily have the capacity to hire someone full-time who has the expertise and understands regulation then the combination of different regulations, how it applies, how we can translate it into technical mm -hmm. solutions. Mm -hmm. At the end, this is, for instance, one of the reasons also why I founded Palki, to offer solutions that can help businesses manage that. So if the law says, do this, and it's very broad, and it, you know, you don't really know a case about how, what does that mean mm -hmm. to me on an <laughs> operational level, that we can support with tools. And with AI, of course, in venturing into AI trustworthiness, we've been here developing new methods, 
specifically focusing on unwanted bias monitoring and performance consistency. So you can cover these requirements um, that are that are part of the EU AI Act. And I guess uh, you've been in Armenia for a short amount of time, but in the time that you've been here, uh, during Femino, you've managed to interact with a lot of female uh, innovators and entrepreneurs. Just uh, could you kind of share with us what impressions that you've had in your time here? Yes, of course. I mean, very short time, but just an extended weekend, essentially. But my first time in Armenia, and I've been so pleasantly surprised. It's such a great country and I love the food, I love the culture, <laughs> and, you know, such rich history. But then at the same time, also at the Femino conference, it was amazing to see the talent, the interest, the, the eagerness to enter the AI industry and to, to be part of the, not just take part in the conversation, but be part of the solution and part of the development. Um, I've come to know realize that there is a great tech community in Armenia with lots of talent. And so it's been absolutely fantastic to connect with some of the individuals here. I've made some great connections that I'm definitely going to follow up with um, after my, my trip back to the UK. That's amazing to hear. Thank you so much for joining us today and having this conversation with us. And thank you for watching CivilNet.